me to be here with you today um, with our family. It's good to see so many uh, familiar faces. Um, this is a wide, let me go here just so that I can see, just so that I can see everybody. It's good to see familiar faces. It's been a while since I've seen so many of you, uh, but we're honored that we get to be here. Like uh, Minu mentioned, I'm here with my wife, Meryl, and our kids. Um, and I, we're thrilled. Um, we, we don't usually come to Yukon too often, but it's nice when we, we get to come, it's good to see friends. And also family. I don't know if you realize this, but I have a sister that attends here at your church. Did you know that? So Annie Mama and Komla uh, Annie Mama is actually my sister. Uh, Annie Mama's mom and my dad are brother and sister. And so it's also an honor to worship with them today and their family. Um, thank you, Pastor Shibu, for the opportunity to come and spend this evening with you. Um, when Jitu mentioned that, um, uh, you know, he invited me to come and speak, and he mentioned the topic, and he said Romans chapter 12. I, was in my, I mean, I didn't say anything to him, but in my mind, I'm going, wasn't there like an easier passage that we could come up with? Because if there's one chapter in the entire Bible that people talk about that has so much depth and just, I mean, there, you can spend years studying that one chapter and I'm thinking, okay, he's giving me like 30 minutes and not that, I mean, if he gave me an hour, I don't know what I would do with that hour because I, I don't feel like I'm equipped to even teach from Romans 12, but thank God he is in control and he's going to speak uh, this, this evening. So whether I mess this up or not, I mean, I'm sure he's going to come and do what he always does best. Amen? Do you believe that God can speak to us this evening? Do you believe that? I think if you, if as a church, as a community, as an individual, if we spend 21 days looking at Romans 12, there is no way you can be the same. There's no way. I grew up in the Middle East. We have very hot summers. July, August was incredibly hot. If you stand outside, you will get a heat stroke if you're not careful. Like there's nothing you can do to avoid it. We would see in the news, people would often say like, please be careful, drink plenty of water because it gets really hot. You cannot avoid it because the circumstance, the environment was such that when you step into that environment, whether you like it or not, that environment is going to change you. It's going to raise your body temperature. And you, you just, you cannot do it. The only option is for you to get inside where there's air conditioning. So I'm telling you, whether you like it or not, when you are in an environment where Romans chapter 12 is being talked about, and we're talking about transforming our lives, and we're talking about the power of the word of God, you can sit, but you are going to change. I promise you. Because that's the power of the word of God. You cannot be the same when you have an encounter with Jesus. You cannot. If you choose to be the same, that's on you. If you decide, I don't want to change, then you won't. Because he's a gentleman. God, God's not going to force himself on you. But if we have that expectant heart and we want something, even if we yield just a little bit of our hearts to him, he can do more than we can ever imagine. So I'm so glad to be here this evening because when I started reading Romans 12, God's been doing something uh, in my life for the past two years specifically. And as I started reading this chapter, and I started reading my portion, verses 9 onwards, I started seeing things in a new light that I hadn't seen when I was reading that, that chapter. So I'm really, I'm excited, and I pray that God will speak to you today through this word. So let's pray. God, I thank you for your presence. I thank you that you're here with us. I thank you that you're going to speak to us. I thank you that you've already been speaking to this church through your word. Let your will be done, Lord, here. In this room, in our hearts, let your will be done, Lord. Help us to surrender. 
Help us to surrender every area of our life. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. When we look at the life of Jesus, he lived an extraordinary life. There's no one in the entire history of mankind that has impacted the world as much as Jesus has. And I was just writing down, like, when I was thinking about Jesus, I started writing down some things, and I thought, okay, so, like, yes, he's the son of God, but I thought, what else? Like, if I were to make a list, the list got really long, so I shortened it, but I'm just going to read some of the things that came to my mind. Jesus, he's the son of God. He came to earth as a man. He died. He rose again. He healed the sick. He raised the dead to life. He cast out demons. He helped fishermen land a great catch. Even the storms obeyed him. He fed thousands of people. But that's not all. He spent time with people. He didn't ignore the lowly. He listened when people spoke to him. He ate with those who were looked down upon. He wasn't bothered when kids ran around while he taught. I know I'm guilty of that, you know, like, uh, uh, not now, and you know, so if your kids scream, it's fine. But, you know, back in the day, it's like, you know, people, kids got to keep quiet, and, and, and Jesus didn't care. He was like, no, no, no. In fact, if you want to enter the kingdom, you got to be like them. He was different. He was a friend to the sinner. Something drew sinners to him. It was very different. He was a confidant to the pious. He was never too busy. Never. He was always available for anyone that wanted to talk. I mean, he had this incredible responsibility in front of him, and he could have created this, 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 this experience where nobody could get to him, and he was always busy, and it's like, you know, you call him up, hey, how are you? I mean, nowadays when people call, first thing they say is, hey, I'm so sorry to bother you. I know you're, what? Busy. But yet Jesus didn't seem to be busy. He wasn't living a hurried life. He was always present in conversations, especially with, with cell phones, you know, like when, when two people have a conversation and I'm, I'm like trying so hard to be better at this, I try not to look at my phone or my watch, you know, because it doesn't show that you're present. But Jesus was always, not that there were cell phones in his time, but you get my point. Jesus was always present in conversations. He truly cared for those around him. There's a poem by Dr. James Allen. It's called One Solitary Life. And I pulled a few passages from it. I want you to hear this. He's writing about Jesus. He says, he never wrote a book. He never held an office. He never went to college. There's an argument for you guys. He never visited a big city. He never traveled more than 200 miles from the place he was born. He did none of those things. All the armies that have ever marched all the navies that have ever sailed, all the parliaments that have ever sat, all the kings that have ever reigned put together has not affected the life of mankind on earth as powerfully as that one solitary life. His name is Jesus. Where am I going with this? Stick with me. Let's look at Romans chapter 12, and I'm going to read from the message translation just because it's, it's a nice devotional kind of uh, translation, and I'm going to read all through 9 to 21. Love from the center of who you are. Don't fake it. Run for dear life from evil. Hold on for dear life to good. Be good friends who love deeply. Practice playing second fiddle. Don't burn out. Keep yourselves fueled and aflame. Be alert, servants of the master, cheerfully expectant. Don't quit in hard times. Pray all the harder. Help needy Christians. Be inventive in hospitality. Bless your enemies. No cursing under your breath. Laugh with your happy friends when they're happy. Share tears when they're down. Get along with each other. Don't be stuck up. Make friends with nobodies. Don't be the great somebody. Don't hit back. Discover beauty in everyone. If you've got it in you, get along with everybody. Don't insist on getting even. 
That's not for you to do. I'll do the judging, says God. I'll take care of it. Our scriptures tell us that if you see your enemy hungry, go buy that person lunch. Or if he's thirsty, get him a drink. Your generosity will surprise him with goodness. Don't let evil get the best of you. Get the best of evil by doing good. I read this and I was thinking about Jesus. And I thought, let me, if I paraphrased this text, thinking about the life of Jesus, how would it read? And so this is my version. This is the Alan George version. This was not in the Bible. This is just me. Not that Alan, this Alan George. Love was at the center of who Jesus was. He chose good over evil every time. He was a good friend who loved deeply. He didn't care about the spotlight. He didn't burn out. He didn't quit when things got difficult. He just prayed all the more. He helped those around him. He blessed his enemies. He laughed with those who were happy and mourned with those who were mourning. He got along with others. He made friends with nobodies. He didn't hit back. He discovered beauty in everyone. He didn't insist on getting even. He was generous. He didn't let evil get the best of him, but instead he overcame evil with good. Why do I bring this up? Why do I bring the story of Jesus and describe him and then compare him with Romans 12, these scriptures that we're looking at? Why? Because a question that I've often had myself and I've had other people ask me was this. Is true transformation really possible? Why do I ask that question? Because when you hear about Jesus and you hear everything that he did and you, 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 you hear the poem and you read the scripture and you see him checking every single box, I don't know about you, but to me sometimes Jesus seems like this person that I can never be like. And yet we are called to be imitators of whom? Christ. How is it possible for you and for me to be imitators of one like this. History was transformed by this one man. His name will scare all the demons away. I mean, this is not any ordinary man. And what God is asking me and you to be is like him. How in the world is this possible? We talk about it. We preach about it. We tell others about it. But I wonder if we believe in ourselves during those moments of great difficulty and great pain. Is true transformation really possible? Or is this just a figment of people's imagination? I don't know about you, but I can tell you there are times I've been a follower of Christ now for over 20 years. There have been times where I'm, I'm doing well and then I'm not doing well and I'm doing well and I'm not doing well. And I, every time I take three steps, I feel like I'm taking five steps backwards and I'm wondering, am I really changed? Am I really transformed? I'll tell you a recent, like this happened yesterday. So um, my wife and I went to Costco, and, um, you, you know, we've been there plenty of times, so I'm, I'm usually aware of everything that's going on, but we were having such an engaging conversation, and I lost track of where we were. How many of you have been to Costco here? Right? A few people, right? So there's a self-checkout place, and usually there's a line at the self-checkout area. We were coming from another side. And so I'm talking to Meryl and we're, I'm just, you know, we're having a great day. Friday, she, she was off. I was off. You know, kids are in school. It's just me and my wife by ourselves. And, and so as we came to the self-checkout area, there was a guy in line and he said, hey, why don't you go ahead? And I was like, such a nice guy. Like, great. And so as I'm going, there's a guy that works at Costco saying, excuse me, sir. Um, 
you, you can't cut. You need to go to the back of the line. I don't know what happened to me in that moment, but something started like bubbling inside. You all don't, I mean, all looking at your, your faces, I mean, you're all like, what is he talking about? For me, just something started bubbling. And I mean, I didn't erupt. I was very calm. And I said the words, you know, I was like, I'm sorry. He, he told me I can go, so I've, you know, I'm just going. Now, those words have the potential of being polite and kind and filled with grace. It didn't really come out of my mouth in that tone. And I was a little bit more stern and very direct. And then the guy who said, you can go, he was like, no, no, I told him he can go. And it started becoming a little bit of a mess. And so then the Costco guy was like, no, go ahead and go. I mean, he's doing his job, right? He's doing his job. Would I... That bubbling thing didn't go away. And so, of course, I could have just gone, but did I go? No. I was like, no, if you want, I can go. And I'm now, like, here. If you want, I can go back to the, the end of the line. Mind you, I've been reading Romans chapter 12 all week. <laughs> and yet something in me, and, and, and as we're walking to the car, Meryl's like, uh are you okay? I mean, you're, I was like, what? I didn't say anything. I was very calm. I was very, you know, it's like, yeah, I could tell. Cause there's a little like, and, and, and literally, I mean, I'm still thinking about it because I thought I figured this out. I thought I had my anger in control. I had a serious anger issue years ago and I thought that was gone and it was solved, but it shows up yesterday in the middle of Costco. So is true transformation really happening in me? God, where am I missing it? What's going on? I think this is a question that so many of us are, are wrestling with. And what I've found is, especially this age, you ask this question, but as you get older, you almost take it for granted. And you may not say it out loud, but you're like, you know what? I don't think anything's going to change. Like somehow I just need to go, like punch my ticket. I need to go to heaven. That's it. But is that the life that Jesus is calling us to? Is he calling us to somehow push through crawl our way, barely make it? Or is he saying, I'm inviting you to a life where you will be made a new creation? Which one is it? That's what I want to talk about. And I think, and this is what I had never seen before, Paul in this one chapter, when you zoom out, he actually provides us with a framework from verse 1 all the way to the end, that will help us see how true transformation actually happens. Are you with me? Are you guys following? Yeah. All right, so let's keep going. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17, I, I shared this already. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone and the new is here. Past two years, like I mentioned, God's really been working on me with this specific topic. Is transformation. Can we be changed in God? And there's a lot of writers, there's a lot of theologians that have taught on this. And so what I'm going to share, honestly, if I try and quote everybody, it's going to be like I'm quoting, quoting, quoting. So I'm just going to give you a blanket quote. If you guys are interested in this, these are some great names for you guys to look up. Dallas Willard is one, Bill Johnson, John Orberg, John Mark Comer, and Marty Solomon. These are five names that have really helped me get a better grasp of what's happening when it comes to spiritual formation or transforming our lives. So before we get into transformation, I want to talk about a couple of myths that people have when it comes to transformation. Sometimes we think we, think we know certain things and we think, that you know, it's like, I, I think this is what the word says, but I'm not 100% sure. So when it comes to spiritual formation, I want to share just three myths, right? The first one is this. We talked about Jesus. The first myth is this. Jesus did what he did because he was God. Jesus did what he did because he was God. Now, it's not completely a myth because he was God. However, he was also man. The Bible tells us in Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 to 8, who being in the very nature God 
did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant by being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. You see, years ago, um, many people questioned the divinity of God. People were saying, oh, Jesus is not God. He's a prophet. He's just a regular, you know, he's, he's a holy man. And they questioned the divinity. In order to counter that questioning, the church, with good intention, started saying, of course he's God, because look at all the miracles he's, he's done. Could a normal man do all these you know, miracles, and could he raise the dead, and could he heal the sick? How could a regular person do this? They were trying to prove the point that Jesus was God, but unintentionally, we're showing people that this is what God does, not what man does. But Jesus came removing his divinity and coming as man to show you and me what a life surrender to God could actually accomplish. That makes sense? Jesus came down to this earth to show you and me this is what a human being who is completely surrendered to God can actually do. So it's not that Jesus did everything because he was God. He's saying, no, no, no. I gave up my position as God so that I can come down to this earth as man to show you what you could also do. Because Jesus said, go and make disciples. Of whom? Of him. Disciples is what? It's somebody that's living and doing what Jesus did. And so we're not, we're not called to just go, hey, Jesus is the only one that did that. He's calling us to do what Jesus did. Are you with me? So the myth is, oh, that's Jesus is God. Like, I mean, we'll say this too. I can't. How am I going to be like God? I mean, it's Jesus. Like, he's special. Yes, he's special, but he's also human. And he's showing us what we could do if our life is surrendered to him. So that's the first myth. The second one. This is a little interesting one because the first time I heard it, I was like, I kind of had to like not, you know, tilt my head a bit. The second one is this. All you have to do is know the Bible. All you have to do is just know the Bible. And what that means is, if I know, if I, if I read everything I can read about flying a plane, and I spend years reading about flying a plane, and I might even find some VR game flying a plane. And finally, I get this opportunity to fly a plane. How many of you would want to come fly with me? Yep. I mean, my, my youngest is also like, not, he's like, I'm not going to come with daddy. Because knowledge doesn't always transfer to transformation. Like, it, knowledge doesn't automatically result in transformation. It's one thing to know something in your head. It's a whole other thing to live it out. You look at the life of the Pharisees. The Pharisees knew the text inside and out, but Jesus walked among them and they couldn't see it. And so there is a myth that we think, as long as I just memorize scripture and as long as I can, I can, I can quote the Bible inside and out, that is, that, doesn't confer, that is not a guarantee that your life is going to be transformed into the life of Jesus. Satan can quote the Bible. Doesn't mean he's transformed. And so there's a myth, the more I just memorize, you know, like, yes, that's good, but it's not the only thing. I'm seeing eyes glazing over. Are you guys with me? Are you not? Yes? Yeah? All right, I'm not going to pick on anybody if you're falling asleep. If this is a place where you feel the presence of God and you go to sleep, praise God, go to sleep. Maybe you need to sleep, right? There's this famous theologian, um, kind of philosopher, Rene Descartes, um, where you read this quote, I think, therefore I am. And today people have said, that's not true. Like, like just because you think a certain way doesn't mean you are that. And so first myth, 
Jesus was God, and so I can't do what he did. Second myth, all I have to know, if I memorize as much as the Bible, transformation can happen. The third one is this, you don't need to do anything. It's all God. You don't need to do anything. Um, have you seen this bumper sticker, let go and let God? You have seen that? It's like a popular quote. It's like, I'm not, not going to do anything, God. I'm just going to, I'm just going to just wait on you. I'm just going to wait. I'm not going to do anything. And we think that we just have to like sit still and not do anything. And all of a sudden, you know, this, this, this magic transformation is going to happen. No, there is a, there's an interaction with God. There's a quote that I really love. Without him, we can't. And without us, he won't. Without him, we can't. And without us, he won't. He chooses to work through us. And so those are three myths that I want to just put it out there so that as we're thinking about am I going to, how do I form myself into the image of Christ, these are some things that I just want to put it out so that we know how do we see through all of this fog, right? So how is transformation actually possible? I'm getting to the meat of it. First of all, transformation is not a Christian thing. It's a human thing. Every one of us are being transformed into something by the, the place we live, by the people around us. Transformation is, nor, is happening every single day in our lives. If we wake up in the morning and not do anything, we're being transformed. The question is, whose image are we being transformed into? That's what we need to figure out. Because you could be on this walk with Christ for 20 years and you will be exactly where you are the day you started if you are not intentional about your transformation with Christ. Are you following? Right? We have to know what is the pathway that I need to take in order to be transformed into Christ. When it comes to spiritual formation, there are two, two ways to look at it. One is unintentional and one is intentional. I've got slides, guys, so you can keep track, all right? This is, a, this is gonna get a little nerdy, so for the rest of you who don't care about this stuff, just pause right now, but I, this, I geek out over stuff like this, because for me, if I don't understand it, I can't, I can't do it. I need to understand it, and so maybe some, there's somebody here who needs to understand it, and hopefully it'll help you. So unintentional spiritual formation and intentional spiritual formation. Unintentional, sure, go to the next slide. So unintentional spiritual formation is this. Do you see this, you see this little diagram, right? Can you see it all clearly? I'll, start, I'll go through each one. Stories we believe. Stories we believe are the stories we believe about ourselves. How did you grow up when you were, uh, as a child? You know, did you have insecurities? Are there labels that you've put on yourself? Are there things that you struggle with? Maybe there's a teacher that said, you know, you know, you know, whatever. And then, and then you're stuck with that thing in your mind of like, oh, yeah. Or, or you know, you feel like, man, no matter how hard I try, I'm never going to, you know, accomplish this. So I'm going to quit trying. There are narratives that we tell ourselves that begin to create a story in our minds. Right? You guys follow? If we grew up in a family or, a, or, or a, a family that is financially struggling, chances are, no matter how much our income increases, we may still struggle with some of those, you know, scarcity mentality type thinking. So the stories you believe are a critical part of who you are. Now, I will say this. This framework is from a pastor named John Mark Comer, and I... I picked this because I, I feel like it really, it made sense to me, so that's part of why I picked it. But I think one of the things that's missing in this is suffering. And I think in my younger years, I didn't really think about that suffering piece a lot. But if you live long enough, you will experience suffering. And when you come face to face with suffering, what you believe and the stories you tell yourself will shape how you respond to suffering. Um, we, our current stage of life, our kids are young and our parents are getting older and we are now the ones who are responsible for both groups. You know, it's one thing when you're young and somebody else is taking care of, of you, but in our stage of life, we've got parents that are older, that are aging, that have health concerns, and we've got little ones. And 
And you've got to figure out, how do I take care of everybody? And so how the stories you tell will determine how you navigate all the things in your life. So stories we believe is one. Does that make sense? Second one is relationships. Uh, There's a quote, show me your friends and I'll show you your... Somebody said it. Future. Show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Because when you hang out with a group of people, chances are you'll become like them, right? If you hang out with people that are passionate about gaming, guess what? You'll start getting interested in gaming. If you're hanging out with people who are interested in music, you might start being drawn to playing musical instruments. And so who you hang out with begins to form you. The last one is habits. Now, this is very interesting because I didn't really understand the impact of habits. A habit, let me, I I have this, there's a book called Atomic Habits by this guy named James Clear. It's so worth reading. But the way he talks about this is we are a little more than the cumulative effect of our habits. Basically, the things we do do something to us. When you do the same thing every day, it creates a neural pathway in your brain to where you can wake up and you don't have to think twice, you just automatically do it. In the same way, if you have a good habit or a bad habit, chances are the more you do it, the more you'll do it. Does that make sense? And so when you look at stories we believe, the people that you're surrounded with and the habits that you have created, you are now you're now seeing what is actually forming you. All of this happens within the environment you live in. We live in Oklahoma City. And so this city, the church that we're part of, the school that you're in, the workplace that you belong to, all of that environment, the way people talk, the way people joke, the way people kid, the way people are passionate about something, the way people get irritated about something, whatever it is, the environment you're in will begin to shape the way you think. When I talk about unintentional spiritual formation, I want you just for a moment, think about the world we're living in. Imagine if we are not intentional about our spiritual formation, if we're not intentional about becoming Christ-like. Think of everything that's happening in the world right now. Think of what's happening in society. My kids are facing challenges that I never faced. We face challenges that previous generations never faced. Things are changing. Can you imagine what our our kids are navigating in their schools? So if there's no intentional spiritual formation, how do we become like Christ? The current is so strong that's pulling not just our kids, and and I don't mean to just say our kids, even us. It's pulling us in a direction that if you don't do anything, you will be swept by that wave. So for us as followers of Christ, we have to make a decision to step out of that current and step into a different one. Um, I don't do this a whole lot now, but years ago I would speak a lot at youth conferences. And when you get around a bunch of teenagers, I can almost tell you in one hand, like, here are the top five issues that I'm going to hear. I almost tell you guaranteed. And it's heartbreaking. And it's not, and the reality is it's not just young people, but it's whatever age, there are people that struggle with all sorts of things. The heartbreaking thing is we want breakthrough, we want change, but we're not willing to do what it takes. We're not. And so today when we talk about this, my prayer is God would highlight in your heart the specific area you need to be working on. But like I said before, you have to decide whether you want to see that change or not. So if this is unintentional spiritual formation, as followers of Christ, what is intentional spiritual formation? So before we go to the next slide, stories we believe, relationships, 
habits within the environment we are in is shaping us. When we look at intentional, each one of those has a counterpart. All right? So sto stories, instead of stories, it's teaching. Now, I know I mentioned this as a myth, talking about, you know, just memorizing scripture. What I meant is you can't just do that. You've got to have other pieces of the puzzle with it. And so teaching, the word of God, learn, getting the word of God in you is a critical part of spiritual formation. You cannot... You cannot do this without knowledge. Like you have to understand what God is telling us, what, what he's saying to us. Romans 12, 1 and 2, be transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. And so there is a teaching component. There is a, there is a renewal that happens in our mind as we begin to get this word of God in us. Now that is coming to church, that's being part of Sunday school, but that's also Spending time on your own with God. You can't just, you know, um, give your spiritual formation responsibility to somebody else. You have to own that for yourself. What are you listening to? Um, we, were, we were at, uh, there was an ICPF camp, I think it was this year. And one of the questions that we got was, I, I don't know how to hear from God. I don't know if I'm hearing clearly. Like, how do I know if I hear something? Is it from God or is it myself? Or, and I remember having this question and, oh my gosh, like if you ask God a question, he will answer. And when he answered, it was like a punch to my gut. Now, I still haven't figured out this for Android phones, but this is what God asked me to do. He said, when I, when I, when I was faced with that same thing, like how do I hear? Because what makes it to where you cannot clearly recognize someone's voice? It could be that you don't know the voice, or it could be that there's a lot of clutter, like there's a lot of noise within the noise, right? And so how many of you have iPhones, like iOS devices, right? So do this with me. So take out your phone, go to settings, right? And within settings, there's this new thing, not new, but it's fairly new. There's this thing called screen time. Do you know what that is? All y'all with your masks, you guys just hiding your, your faces. I know, I know you know what I'm talking about. When I looked through my screen time, there was no shock why I couldn't clearly hear the voice of God. Because, yeah, I had my little Bible app over there, but there was also a ton of other stuff. And so if we are trying to clearly hear the voice of God, we need to identify where's the clutter? What else is there? And... If we care enough to be willing to give up the things that we need to give up. It's one thing to know it. It's a whole nother thing to do it. You know, when you compare your Netflix screen time views to your time in the word, like, how does it compare? Or the time you're on social media or what? I mean, there's proof that the first thing Majority of the people do when they wake up in the morning is they look at social media, first thing. And so if we are to be forming ourselves into the image of Christ, how can I form myself into his image when all I'm doing is consuming the image of the world? I'm going to look like what I consume. And so teaching is a critical part of spiritual formation, and, and teaching is a broad word, but it is what you allow into your mind, what you allow into the window of your heart through your eyes. What are you allowing? And is what you're allowing forming you into the image of Christ? Second, community. Just like we talked about, show me your friends, I'll show you your future. I think at the heart of the church, the capital C church, the church that is the body of Christ, it's clear that we cannot do this ourselves. We have to do life with each other. When, when I was reading through Romans, um, in Romans 12 verse 5, it says, So in Christ we, though many form one body, each member belongs to all the others. 
Imagine if we just lived that one verse out. For we will know them by the way they love each other. The community that we're a part of, the church that we're a part of, we ha- and it's not just, and I don't mean just coming and attending a service, but are we inviting opportunities where we're inviting people into our lives and we're vulnerable with each other and we're sharing our struggles and it's not about let me put up my best image so that everyone thinks like my life's perfect. No, no, no. It's about saying, hey, I'm struggling today. Can you pray for me? Can you help me? Can you stand with me? Can you walk with me? It's not about our best, you know, just let me put my best foot forward. You see this when you are, you know, when you do premarital counseling or you talk to couples or couples who just got married. Um, it, it's interesting because uh, you hear how they say, you know what? I didn't realize how much of a jerk I was only until after I got married. And I was like, well, what do you mean? It's like, man, I, like everything I do is wrong. No matter what I try, like everything I do is wrong. I know you guys are all like perfect couples here, so you have no clue what I'm talking about. But for, you know, this is for people like other people. They say like, especially like first couple of months, it's like, man, I'm, I say the wrong thing. I do the wrong thing. I look the wrong way. I'm wearing the wrong, like everything. Like the reason why is because all of a sudden when you're married, you have a mirror with you, walking with you and going, this is how you're going out today, <laughs> you know, versus before you're married, you just do whatever you want. There's no one calling you out or, or, or if you have a fiance, they only see you a few times. But when you are in community, there's accountability that comes with that. And it's an accountability that we need to invite into our lives. Nowadays, it's like, man, if you tell me something wrong with me, if you don't like the way I, I act or I dress, it's like, well, I'm going to find different friends. And we're constantly choosing different people so that we can find our little hallelujah choir on the side that just praises everything we do. God's calling us to true community where there's a sharpening of each other, where someone would call you out and say, hey, man, the way you, I saw you in Costco, The way you talked, that was not right. We need each other. We cannot do this life without each other. So we need the teaching. We need the word of God. We need community and we need practices. We need, some people call it spiritual disciplines. A lot of people don't like the word discipline because it sounds like you're getting into trouble. So a way to think about it is a spiritual practice. So we talked about habits. Just like if you do something every day, chances are it's going to be hardwired into your brain. If you change, you can actually teach yourself new behavior. When I was thinking about an example, the example, so we actually used to live here in Yukon when I first moved. So I moved here in 2004. And when I came here to the U.S., I was introduced to something that changed my life. Changed it. Changed it. I mean, less than Jesus. Like, it's not equivalent to Jesus. But, I mean, it literally changed my life. First time we're going, we went to a restaurant um, after we got married. And I was looking through the menu and I saw this thing. And I, I didn't even know that there was such a thing. Like, you know, I, I grew up in the Middle East and we have good food, but like this was different. This was a whole nother level. They, I found out that people take cheese and they bread it and they deep fry it and they serve it to you. And I, like you don't under, it was almost as if I had seen snow for the very first time. I saw this thing and I thought, where has this been all my life? And I mean, I, I would order it all the time. And I would tell Meryl, I could not understand people who would pay good money, like hard earned money and buy a salad. I, I just did not, under, I was like, this is like, this leaves, like why are you spending, you know, whatever amount of money but like, are you in, like, there's fried cheese. Why would you give that up and eat a tomato? I had, like, it was just, I mean, you can ask her. I would, con- we would go for business meetings or whatever, and people would be like, oh, I'll have a salad. And I'm going, are you, like, you're paying 15 bucks for a sa-? Like, are you kidding me? You can get, like, 25 of these from Walmart for, like, a dollar. Like, 
go outside and pluck some leaves. Like, it, I just could not understand it. Like, why would you not have a good steak or, you know, and if there are vegetarians here, I'm sorry. But it's just like, this was what my mind was until I turned 40. So I'm 43 right now. When I turned 40, a friend of mine said, hey, have you, you know, been to a doctor recently? And I was like, no. And he said, well, you know, when you're 40, things change. I was like, tell me more. Like, this seems very interesting. Well, it doesn't change for the better. You know, kind of gave me this pep talk and said, you should go see a doctor. So I went, you know, just a general checkup. And this doc, man, they did blood work on me and all the mozzarella sticks that I've ever eaten showed up on that report along with the tres leches cakes and the tiramisu and the fried chicken, like everything showed up on that report, like everything, everything. Do you smoke? No. Do you drink? No. But mm, the rest of this, you know, and so the doctor looks at me and said, bro, you, something's got to change. Something has to change. And I was like, in my, like, you don't understand. In my mind, I would never never pay money for a salad. I may eat it if it comes as a side item, you know, like for free, sure. Like drown it in blue cheese and I'll eat it. But I would never, until this doctor says, if things don't change, you're not going to be here for too long. All of a sudden I'm going, hey, so can I see your salad menu? But guess what? Three years into this, I actually like salads now. I know. I'm changed. I've been transformed. The same brain that hated a salad, when I started changing my habit, what tasted horrible in my mouth the first time I ate it, didn't taste that bad the next time, and didn't taste that bad the next time, and didn't taste that, and actually over time, not overnight, but over time, things changed. Oh, Pastor Allen, you don't understand. Sitting down to pray is so hard for me. I can't. My mind gets distracted. Don't start with 75 hours all at once. Can you give a minute? Can you give two minutes? If you want to be formed into the image of Christ, there is a certain action that you have to take. And are you willing to take that step? So when we think about Intentionally being formed in Christ, there's teaching, getting, making sure the word of God's in you. There's having the right people around you. And last, those practices. And when I read Romans 12, 9 onwards, it really is a list of practices that we can operate on. Romans 12, 9, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Change your ways. Change those habits that you need to change and cling to the good habits that you need to change. I'm, I'm getting ready to close, but I'll, I'll say this because I don't want to have any confusion here. I don't want you thinking, so Alan, are you saying that I'm going to earn my salvation with God? Because what you're talking about is, yes, teaching. You're talking about being around people. You're talking about these practices. Are you saying that I now have the ability to change by myself in such a way that I now earned my salvation by works. That's not what I'm saying. Because here's what scripture says in Romans 2, or Ephesians 2 verse 8. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. So this is Paul talking in Ephesians, right? Let's read Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 to 13. Paul, same writer, says this. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to what? What's Paul saying here? Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. The original word, I'm probably messing up the way I say this, but... Catergasomai or whatever it is. That's the word, right? Can you guys put that on the screen? The, the original trans, uh, translation for workout is this word. And what it means, it's coming kind of. There we go. What it means is to continually work to bring something to completion or fruition. 
If I want to go and play the keys today, and I stand in front of those key, that keyboard and say, I'm going to play like Mozart played, do you think I can do that? Uh, yeah, I can't. Just in case you're wondering, like, is this a trick question? No, it's not. I can't. But if I were to train over time, would it be possible that I could maybe pull something like that off? I could. There's a difference between trying and training. And when we are wanting to become like Christ, when we are looking at being transformed into the image of Christ, sometimes we keep trying and God's trying to tell us, no, 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 all you need to do is train. Training is different from trying. Training means, you know what? I'm going to get up today and I'm going to give it my best. Because it is a partnership with God. Is salvation a free gift? Yes, it is. But it involves us being responsible for what we have to do. This is what Paul says in Philippians 3. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. And so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead, not that I've already obtained all of this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on. If God's calling us to be formed into his image, then we need to own our responsibility in this. Because God will do what he promises to do if we press on. So when, when I'm talking about intentional spiritual formation, I'm talking about pressing on part. It's not waking up and say, God, I'm just going to hope you do everything for me and I'm just going to like lie here. No, it's saying, God, I'm going to wake up and you know what? I'm going to be intentional. First thing, instead of looking at social media, I'm going to look at your word. I'm going to read your word. I'm going to spend time in prayer before I let anything else around me. And I realized that there are friendships in my life that I need to probably cut off because it's not the right kind of people I need to have. And so God, I'm going to trust you to bring the right people into my life. And I'm going to start some daily practices. I, I want to show you this real quick. I know I'm running out of time and I'm really sorry, but I want to show you this list. If you're thinking about what are certain pr uh, practices that you could have, this is not all of it. This is just an example of what some of them could be. There's fasting, there's prayer, there's scripture, there's generosity. And when I mean practice, you don't have to do all of this. If you're struggling, for example, with a scarcity mindset when it comes to your finances, maybe the spiritual practice that you can counter that with is generosity. Be praying about, God, who can I bless today? Or maybe you're busy, you're so busy, you're running so many miles a, a, you know, an hour every single day of the week. Maybe you need to block out couple of hours on the weekend and just say, you know what, I'm going to intentionally stop doing that and I'm going to spend time with God. I'm going to be intentional. It's identifying what is the counter habit that you need to find for the practice in your life. And all of this, remember in the previous one I talked about environment, all of this in intentional spiritual formation, instead of environment, it's the Holy Spirit. Because we cannot do this without him. We can't. We can't. We cannot. It's impossible. But he won't do it without us. And so, I know we talked about a lot of things today. And there was a lot of topics covered. Here's my ask. In teaching, community, practices, and Holy Spirit, all of those four things... I want you to think about the one area that God's calling you to focus on. Just one. You don't have to do all of them. Just one. Maybe you're not getting enough of the word in you. Maybe you're distracted by things of the, of the world and you're consuming content that's distracting you from who God is. Maybe teaching. Maybe it's making a commitment during these 21 days and saying, God, I'm going to spend more time in your word. I'm going to let more of that fill my heart. Maybe that's your one. Or it's finding the right community. Maybe you've been surface level with people. You haven't been honest with your relationships. And you've been hiding the struggles that you've been dealing with in your heart. Maybe God's calling you to be praying for a trusted friend or a trusted group of people where you can go and say, Hey, I'm having a hard time. Can you help me figure this out? Maybe community, that's your one. 
Or maybe it's a spiritual practice. Maybe you're struggling with an addiction and you're trying to figure out how do I get rid of this addiction no matter what I do, nothing's working. Well, maybe God's calling you not to just get rid of an addiction but replace it with a spiritual practice. Identify what is that struggle you're having and figure out what is the spiritual practice that I can start bringing into my life so that I create the right habits so that I'm formed in the image of God. And maybe it's the Holy Spirit piece. You're just busy and you haven't been sensitive to His voice. The reality is He's there and He's willing to speak and He's willing to change and He's willing to work with us. And so if we can bow our heads in prayer for a quick moment, can I have someone on the keys real quick? This moment is between you and God. There's nobody that can make this decision for you. There's no one that can um, tell you what this needs to be. But what is it for you? I think young and old, every one of us, if we are alive, no matter who we are, no matter how long we've been following God, we all have more of us that need to become more of Him. And so, which one is it for you? I want you to really ask God to speak to you. I love the songs that we sang today. They, they all talked about surrender. It talked about, God, not my will, but your will be done. In order for us to see His will being done on earth, we need to become like Him. With every eye closed and every head bowed, I just, I just want to know if, if, God's, if God has spoken to you and He showed you which one is yours? Can you quickly just shoot up your hand? I'd love to pray for you and you can put it back down. If you've seen your one, thank you. I see that. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Thank you. Thank you for trust. Thank you. I see that. Thank you. I see that hand in the back. Thank you. Just take that to him right now. God, I just thank you for your word. Your promise is that whenever your word goes forth, it will never return back to you void. I pray for your people as they are seeking your face these 21 days, God. And they're just letting your word just fill their heart and change them and transform them. I pray specifically for those who have just raised their hands right now. You see their heart. You see what they're navigating, what they're dealing with, what, what, what area they need to bring in alignment with you. I pray, merciful Father, that you would do a miracle in their life, Lord. That they would experience true transformation. That they would see themselves being changed by you, by your word, by your community, and by what you've taught us, to the, the way to live through your word, Lord. I pray that their life would change, God. I thank you for the work that you're doing here. I thank you for your spirit moving in this place, God. I pray as they continue to seek your face, God, let your, let your presence fill this room. Let your presence fill this room. God, I pray for the hurting people in this community, those who don't know you, Lord. I pray, God, that, this, that they would see the difference in this church and they would come in these doors asking, God, what is it that you have that I don't have? And that, Lord, you would bring new people to this church, that you would, you would bring new people here, God, from all walks of life that we would see a revival break forth in this church, God. God, you see the prayers and the cries of your people. I pray that you would honor them, Lord. Father, we know that when we surrender our lives to you, God, that you 
promise to be with us and you promise to work within us, God. And so I pray that you would do only what you can do, Lord. Can we sing that I surrender real quick? I surrender all. As we're singing this song, I pray that you would just sing it one more time, just asking God to move in your heart.